Everybody knew something was going on, and no one did a thing. Hello and welcome to episode 91 of Popcorn and Prosecco, a show that's all about talking about movies. I am Perry Nemiroff, and here are my co-hosts, Christy Puchko and Angie Han. Hello! Uh, so this week, our hot topic is going to be sampling movies, which we will discuss further in a moment. And then we're going to jump into our full review of Spotlight. So first, Christy, you've got our hot topic. Okay, so we're talking about movie sampling, which for those of you who might have missed Mike D'Angelo's AV Club review, uh, he's a New York critic who talks specifically about how he has a kind of process when he's catching up with movies where he will watch the first 10 minutes and decide whether or not he's going to bail. Now, I should make clear that he doesn't watch 10 minutes of a movie and then basically review it. Like, if he bails, he doesn't write about the movie is what he said. Um, But he kind of has promoted sampling as a way to kind of make it through a shit ton of movies, pointing out that like 800 movies have been released in New York this year and, you know, he can't make it through all of those. So that's how he deals. Now, uh, I wanted us to kind of discuss sampling and what we think of it as a method of kind of getting a feel for a movie. And anytime we feel like we would have missed out on a movie if we hadn't watched the whole thing. I don't see any problem with it as long as he's not reviewing anything or covering it in a way that implies that he watched the whole thing. I mean, I kind of get it, too, because, you know, I mean, we all have the same problem. There's so many movies co- that come out every year. And every every single year, no matter how many movies I've seen, when I hit the point where I have to write my top ten, I'm always like, shit, I didn't see that, that, and that, and that. So, you know, I, I do get it. Obviously, there's ups and downs to approaching movie watching this way, though. Yeah, I mean, I also like that because I think we've all had that thing where watching a movie is a big commitment. Like, even if you're just sitting on your couch and watching it at home, you have to be like, well, I gotta have nothing on my schedule for the next two hours to watch this movie. And I'll be honest, there are times where that has stopped me from watching a movie because I'll be like, well, I don't know if I want to commit to a movie. And then what if I don't like it? Or like, you know, what if I end up getting busy or something? So then I like this idea of just like sampling of like trying out 10 minutes, because I feel like that's I honestly, I, like, as soon as I read the article, I was like, this might be something I try out because I think it would encourage me to actually try out more movies. And not only that, but try out movies that I don't necessarily know if I'll like because it's much easier, you know, mentally, it's much easier for me to say, like, well, I'm not sure about this movie, but I'll give it 10 minutes to see if it hooks me in as opposed to, well, I better set aside the rest of the evening for a sure. movie I may or may not like. And I understand that, but what worries me a little bit is that I feel like there have been movies that I have not liked at the 10-minute mark, at the 15-minute mark, at the four, even at the 40-minute mark, which is his last point where he will bail on a movie. But then, like, something clicked. Like, for me, Cosmopolis was a movie that I hated and I felt really uncomfortable with and I felt like I wasn't engaging with. But I think that that was a movie that took me to the hour mark for me to kind of click into what it was doing. And then I really liked it. And the next time I watched it, I was like, this is amazing. But I mean, if I had bailed, I never would have known that. You know what I mean? So like, that's where I get worried about it. I know what you mean. And I think it's an imperfect system. And to his credit, he acknowledges that, you know, there are movies that he's seen where what he thought of it at first, you know, once he stuck with it, turned out to be very different from what he thought he was going to think of it. But I think, you know, and as Perry pointed out also, it's it's a terrible idea if you're going around then pretending you saw these movies and casting judgment on them. But I think just as like a day to day thing, like as a way to try to try to sample a bunch of things, I think it works. I mean, you're right, though. There are movies um, that I have seen. There are even movies, I'll be honest, that I've seen all the way through and not liked and had to watch a second time to like it. Mm-hmm. Like um, one one example I've been thinking about recently is The Big Lebowski, which the first time I saw it, I didn't like at all. And then I ended up seeing it again. And then I, you know, and a few more times and I fell in love with it. So I get what you're saying. But at the same time, like, it's not like I'm going to try every movie four times to see if I like it better. It's also kind of nice, though, that the whole rise of streaming and VOD, well, not necessarily VOD, because you pay for VOD. I just like that you're allowed to do this if you want, like a casual moviegoer, because let's say, you know, you do get a half hour in and you turn it off. That gives them the opportunity to watch another one. It just like gives people true. more options and more opportunities to watch more. And I, I just love the fact that we're not stuck paying like what what does it cost now to see a movie and then like you're, you're just stuck in, you're stuck in that seat no matter what and I just remember those feelings I mean I still get those feelings now but we do we go to we're lucky enough to go to screenings but I've paid for movies and you know I, yeah. like I'm stuck there and I'm not gonna walk out because I already paid for it I have a sneaking suspicion the reason I've been able to maintain my love of movies as long as I have is in part that the last several years I haven't had to pay for really terrible movies I've gotten to see them in advance and then I don't have that that additional 
anger of not only did I give up my time to this whole movie, I paid to give up my time to this whole movie. So I can understand that aspect of it, especially in this time of year where we're getting like stacks of screeners. Like I already have a stack of screeners. There's no way I'm going to be able to get through. And it's it's only started. I've only started getting them two weeks ago. And it's like, think, oh, sorry. It's really intense. It's, you know, so like some of them, I know last year I did this a couple, with a couple of movies where like I started like The Most Wanted Man and it was just like not in the headspace. So I never saw what was Most Wanted Man. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it, I don't think that this I, I don't think that he is advocating that we all like live by this as our guiding principle, um, nor do I think that that would be a good idea. But I do think that if there's like, you know, if, if like, you know, in Christie's case, you have a stack of movies you need to get through and you're not sure, I think it's a good way to kind of dive Prioritize. in and make it a little bit more manageable. You can't necessarily commit three hours, to ev- two or three hours to every single movie to see if you're going to like it. There just aren't enough hours in the day. Uh, so Maybe we should maybe we should wrap up unless you guys have anything else to say. Is this something that you guys have tried or think that you will want to try? No, I'm a perfectionist and like a completist. It's like when I start reading a book, like even though it takes me like three months to read a book, if I start a book and I hate it, I will finish it. Wow. And same, th- same thing with movies and same thing with TV shows. It's weird. I've done it with like TV shows and, and, and books, like where I've tried a little bit and been like, nope. And like with movies, it's harder. And I, the only time I do it regularly is at the end of the year when I have a stack of screeners and on like a lazy Sunday where I have something specific in mind I want to watch but can't find it. So I'll like start three different horror movies and just be like, nope, 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 nope. Like, I don't know. But it's weird to me that he's so public about this because when I don't finish a movie, it's like my secret shame and I want no one to know. Um, I'm probably, not only am I going to try this, I'm probably going to try this tonight. Because honestly, like that thing, Christy, you were just saying about how sometimes you like try a bunch of horror movies and you're just like, nope, nope, nope. Like the thing is, it feels like such a commitment that there have been times where I put on a movie on Netflix and then two minutes in, I'm like, I just don't know if I have two hours for this. So I turn it off. And I mean, in that, in that, in like moments like that, wouldn't have, wouldn't it have been better for me to say, well, I'll give this 10 minutes and see if it, I feel like it's worthy of my time. So honestly, and And I'm also one of those people that, like, can spend half an hour browsing Netflix because I'm paralyzed by indecision. So I'm, like, actually really excited to try this out and see if it uh, solves my problem at all. Well, maybe we should move on to a movie that is well worth two hours of your time. Or at least I think it is all around. And do you want to introduce Spotlight? Uh, Yeah, very good segue, Perry. Good job. Boom. Uh, Okay, here's the synopsis. The true story of how the Boston Globe uncovered the massive scandal of child molestation and cover-up within the local Catholic archdiocese. Did I say that correctly? That is how you say diocese. Okay, good. Uh, Shaking the entire Catholic church to its core. As you could probably tell by the by my inability to pronounce archdiocese, I was not raised Catholic. But I feel bad now because I feel like I should have introduced this movie because I was raised Catholic. But no, it's you okay. handled it very well. That's how you say archdiocese. You're solid. So I should, I'm just going to edit that part out then and then the world will just think that I always knew how to say it. But anyway, so this, <laughs> this movie stars uh, Michael Keaton, Rachel McAdams, uh, Mark Ruffalo, and, uh, and, oh, and Brian Darcy James. That's his name. As uh, the four reporters at the Boston Globe that start to dig into this story about uh, child molestation. And it's it's a, it's a subject that when you hear what this movie is going to be about, you're just like, oh, fuck, that's going to be harrowing and depressing and awful. Or at least I was. But one thing I one thing I came out of this movie being so impressed by is how Tom McCarthy, the director, manages to he doesn't sugarcoat it or downplay the horror of it at all. But he also doesn't sensationalize it. It's not like a movie that's just like, you know, that's just like it like revels in this scandal and drama. And it's not a movie that, you know, p- paints anyone as just flat out evil. But at the same time, it's not a movie that pretends like, oh, you know, it's not that bad. Let's let these people off the hook. I just feel like it's a really tough balancing act to pull off. And he does it really, really well. It's aided in a large part by, um, like, I thought Michael Keaton was was especially good in the role because he yeah. he plays a he plays a journalist who is you know he grew up in Boston like right next to the church where some of this stuff was happening and you just see like all the kind of conflicting forces play out in him and in his performance and I thought he was fantastic. I thought it was really interesting because like Tom McCarthy brings a lot of humanity into the movie and like you said I actually thought it was a really funny movie which I mean I joked in my review for Pajiba I was like how dare a movie about child molestation be this charming but it, I wouldn't it, say funny but it, it yeah, is. Yeah I wouldn't like, say that either. I think it, it's funny. It has funny. a better sense of humor than I expected. I wouldn't say it's actually funny. I only remember one actual laugh in the audience and that was about a certain uh, era appropriate billboard. Mm, yes but 
I, but it's like, it has like a warm kind of a, a humanity to it. I mean, I think it's the best way of saying it. Like Mark Ruffalo is like a really anxious ridden person, but like his determination to get this story right, I felt very moved by and very, oh no, you know what? There's also people laughing the Xerox section, which doesn't sound funny. I know. You know what this reminds me of? It's like the paper. Xeroxing. Is like, it's hilarious. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> loves the Xerox scene. I feel like, like people are just like picturing someone like you know, bare naked sitting on a copy machine. Oh, God. Thing. <laughs> That's no. what you make it sound um, like. <laughs> no, that'd be wrong. Okay, but the thing is, it's like, what what I like about this movie is, it's like the movie The Paper, which also was a Michael Keaton movie, where it's it's about that frenzy and that that need to do something right, but how it's not even just the big bureaucracy that can get in your way, but stupid little things. And and I thought that they managed to bring a lot of, of life into a very dour subject. Like, when I heard about Spotlight, I was like, oh, this is going to be like like 12 Years a Slave, where I know it's going to be good filmmaking because of everybody around it, and I know I'm going to be glad I saw it, but I'm not, like, I do I want to let this into my heart and soul because it's going to be so hard to watch? And Spotlight is not hard to watch, which is I thought was really surprising and wonderful, um, not as a discredit to 12 Years. 12 Years is amazing. It's just a very different movie. It's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a good movie, but it's one that I don't really want to watch again just because it's really depressing. 12 and years there aren't that me. many times in my life where I'm like, you know what I'm in the mood for? A three-hour drama that's going to make me really depressed about slavery. But Spotlight yeah. was a movie that I, I walked in. I was like, I kind of want to see this again. Like, I, yeah. it almost felt weird to be like, I want to watch a movie about like how the Catholic yeah. Yeah, and like you said, it's children, also but... just a very smart movie too. Like part of the reason I would want to watch this again is not just because I found it like very entertaining, but also because I found it so incredibly informative. Like I, I followed, you know, the basics when all of this was unfolding in the media, but I didn't know all the teeny tiny details. And while I feel like I did absorb a good deal of them while I was watching the movie, I definitely think that when I sit through it again, I'm going to pick up like on little things certain people were responsible for, how they connected the dots a little yeah. more. I just feel like I'm going to get more and more out of this movie the more I watch it. What I also liked is that the characters in the film are varying degrees of Catholic, which is because in a town like Boston, a lot of people are Catholic. And like where I grew up uh, in Western Pennsylvania, just about everybody I knew was Christian, if not specifically Catholic. So when those allegations started coming out, it, I related to how the people in the movie related to it, which your first response is uh, shock and then kind of also a little bit of like, are we really surprised? And I know that sounds horrible, but it's like I there was always those those priests that you were kind of told not to be alone with. And and it's like. At the time, it's just that's how everybody behaves, so it didn't seem weird. But like watching the movie, I was really astonished to kind of see that play out in a very interesting way. And uh, you know how it's it's everybody is culpable because everybody looks the other way. And it's like maybe you didn't know specifically, like I didn't know specifically shit. But like when things started coming out, and even about priests that I knew, like not at the time, but later, there's a whole thing. I'm not going to get into all this, but like when you hear it later, you're like, oh yeah, actually. That would make sense with this tendril of a go rumor I heard ages ago, you know, and it's it's shocking and it's disturbing. And what's interesting about the movie is it it shines a spotlight on the evil uh. and says this is how, you know, we as people can unite and stop this. And I thought that that was a really powerful message because it's not an easy thing to do. It's much easier to look the other way. It's much easier to be like, Ugh, I don't want to be the person to like say, hey, is that fucked up, that thing? Like... You know, is that whatever? And I, I think that's really impressive. I also like the way the film brings children into the movie because there's no flashbacks or scenes of abuse. There's no like, you know, lurid details thrown at you like that. Instead, people tell their stories and you get to focus on an actor like reliving a moment rather than like, you know, graphic details. And instead you see children like in the frame or whatever, but they're just kids. They're just kids having their lives. So it reflects to you the sense of interruption. And, and, you know, the power of the church is shown through, like, towers of the church shown all over the neighborhoods of Boston. It's amazing. Also, the Boston accents were, like, good enough and not distracting, like, fucking Black Mass. So cheers to them. I, yeah. I also found it really interesting how they kept the focus solely on the investigation. I mean, it's kind of like what you said before. Like, it would have maybe made it, sadly, more Hollywood had they shown flashbacks and terrible things happening to people. And also, like, it's a very typical thing to, I don't know, maybe cut to one of the uh, the reporters investigating it, like, like super sad at home or, like, 
I don't know, how it's affecting their personal lives in a more heavy-handed manner than they do. So it kind of speaks to what you said before about, like, the movie having a lot of humanity without actually, like, digging into their personal lives more than I would expect it to. Yeah, I kind of like that because it's like all the Spotlight team gets slight arcs and we get to know them a little bit emotionally, but it doesn't get, like bogged down or distracted by that it's like you want to know it's not them a, it's not about them it's about what they're doing and yeah I think the movie yeah is like and really it's like we basically see we see them only in so far as how their personal lives are impacted by the work they do which this is a deeply disturbing story rooted in their community so of course it has an impact yeah one thing i liked about it is though that the movie also just does a really good job of showing how this happened like going back a little bit christy you were talking about how in your community it was just kind of there and you didn't really think about it and that's one thing this movie does so well is show how this environment that it's i mean yes there are very bad people involved with bad motives that's you know that is clear when you when there's someone molesting small children obviously but it does show you how an environment without really meaning to can kind of allow something like this to happen and how, you know, how people can be blind to something, even good people with good intentions who actually do mean well. And, you know, they don't want anything bad to happen, but it's kind of like when you're just surrounded by water, it, you know, like that analogy about like the frog in the water yeah. and how like it gets hotter and hotter and he doesn't know to jump out. It's a lot like that where there's just, where to these people, and I think the movie does such a great job of showing this. It's it's not that, oh, the people of Boston are, are bad or Catholics are bad and that's why they're doing this. It's just that, it's just become such an ingrained part of their community that a lot of these people, it doesn't really, they don't really think to look outside of it. And, you know, like yeah, they, and the they have been taught to prioritize God and church above all else. So, you know, the, the thought of like speaking out against something the church is doing is, is bizarre and terrifying to a lot of these people, especially Well, it's also first. that in the film, they have the introduction of the Lee Schreiber character, who is a guy from Miami. He's not a part of the community. And so when he he's hears Jewish, like a tendril of a story, really he's like, well, why aren't we following Catholic. up on that? And everybody's like, oh, well, the church. And like, you know, it be, it, because you don't. And it's, I know it seems crazy. It was literally like when those stories started coming out and a friend of mine was like, you guys are probably super shocked, right? And I was like, uh, yes and no. And it's like, because I had never thought about it in terms of molestation, but I had definitely, there was a culture of don't look that way, don't talk about this. And, and so you just don't think about it. It's like, you know, I know that, oh, it's like when you hear about Scientology stuff and you hear about how they're taught not to read things that are angry, like that are dis dis discrediting Scientology. And it's that kind of thing where you become part of a community that says we are as a group not going to look at this, but it's not said explicitly. So you don't think about it. And I think the way the film explains it doesn't doesn't excuse that kind of thought process but explains it to people who may look at these things and be like, how do you not say something? And it's it because it's not that simple. It. it doesn't excuse it. It just kind of shows how that's a very human thing, a very human way to react, you know, for better or for worse, in this case, worse. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And especially because I think a lot of the victims, as the film points it out, they feel alone in it. And so... It, 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 yeah, it's it's a whole thing about a community versus just there were these terrible priests and this terrible thing happened and we fixed it. And I think that that's a much more interesting story. And I, I credit Tom McCarthy for that incredibly. And like, I feel like we should point out before I forget uh, that Tom McCarthy has done incredible movies before. He did, uh, oh, for God's sakes, I clicked on his IMDb and it popped up a couple of movies he's done. So it's like 2012. Like, no, not that. He directed The Visitor and The Station Agent and Win Win, which were all really beautiful movies. And then he did The Cobbler, which no one talks about uh, or should talk about. Um, but, like, he has a really great sense of humane storytelling where he'll tackle a topic that is upsetting, like misanthropy or, like, um, The Visitor was about uh, uh, immigration and and um, Win Win was about an at-risk child. And, like, he does it in a way where it becomes relatable instead of something, you know, we want to push away and not deal with. It's very uh, empathetic becomes, filmmaking. Yeah, it's very empathetic. I, and I think that's really impressive. And I mean, this cast, man, god damn. Oh my god. Well, going back to Liev Schreiber, he was fantastic in that role. I just loved, you know, the balance between him feeling like he was going to come in and like ruin what the office had set up, but also like trusting him and knowing he was pushing them in the right direction. He was great. Yeah, the ensemble's amazing. I wish the Oscars did an ensemble award because, like, I feel like that's when the Oscars become really shitty is when, like, this cast is all outstanding. What are you going to do, pit them against each other or act like some of them are supporting characters when they're really all leads? 
Well, maybe not Rachel McAdams and uh, Brian Darcy James, but I would say like Ruffalo and Keaton are both leads, but they're not going to pit them against each other. So what do you do? You know, that uh, Oscars bug me increasingly. <sighs> <laughs> we'll we'll have a, a hot topic section for that in yeah. a couple months maybe but yeah but i think spotlight is outstanding i think if it's playing near you you should absolutely go see it whatever your religious inclinations because it's a story that speaks specifically or that that focuses on something specifically but speaks broadly about you know oh god i'm gonna say the human condition i know how that sounds but i think it's a movie that's generally entertaining i think it's going to be a heavy hitter come oscar season so if that's important to you you're going to want to be a part of this oh without a doubt i mean aren't the large majority predicting at this point at least that it will win right now it's like, my it's front the runner front, it's the front runner. because the martian's great but it's genre well my personal front runner like if i got to pick is, it is, Bro- is brooklyn ah. but like obviously that's not going to happen but i'd be very happy to see spotlight win why Actually, do you think brooklyn's gonna not going to one- happen sorry well i'm curious why perry thinks brooklyn can't be a front runner because i don't think enough people are seeing brooklyn compared okay. to this i mean that it just it does come down to that voting yeah. wise no it does i think brooklyn's beautiful i wonder my fear is more that it's too simple and that it's about a woman and statistically that, the Oscars don't well, give a shit about women be female stories. It too. It's funny that you guys bring up Brooklyn because while we were talking, I was just thinking about how this movie kind of reminds me of that and that it's it's a really like small story in some ways, like a very small, very specific story, but in a way that kind of speaks to a much larger truth about the human condition, as Christy put it. There are also movies that just like don't throw emotions in your face. They're not like saying, you know, this they is how a character them. feel. They, and like that's part of the reason that this movie isn't a total drag because it could have been really depressing but it's not and it's for that reason well the other thing is it's a, it's you know while it's a movie about bad things happening it's ultimately a movie about a group of people who are trying to you know stretch beyond what they what they're upbringing and trying to do something good so it's actually more i wouldn't say like it feels weird to say it's a feel-good movie and it's not exactly but it's a movie that kind of makes you feel inspired by what people are capable of and like what Definitely. people can accomplish when they try yeah it's like a realist Opti- like a like a realistic sense of optimism as opposed to like and here's the big happy ending where everything is fixed forever like it doesn't give you that um instead it actually kind of gives you a wallop in those final moments but it's powerful and it 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 makes you believe that change is possible but not easy and i think that that's a really sophisticated message beautifully told so i think that pretty much sums it up there uh, I was going to say three thumbs up, but I guess six thumbs, six thumbs all the up thumbs. all around. All the thumbs Every for thumb Spotlight. Every thumb I have is pointing up at this movie. All right. So go see Spotlight this weekend. Um, I guess that's it. So that's a wrap on episode 91 of Popcorn and Prosecco. You know the deal. Go over to iTunes where you can subscribe and also comment and rate. Then we have our website, popcornprosecco.com. We are on Facebook where you can like us, go on Twitter, and follow us at Popcorn Prosecco. And then the three of us are all over the internet as well. Angie, where do you want to go first? Yes, you can find me on Twitter at AJHAN, and I write for slashfilm.com. Christy? You can find me on Twitter at Christy Puchko. That's K-R-I-S-T-Y-P-U-C-H-K-O. And I write all over the web, but you can find my career highlights at decadentcriminals.com. I feel like I could repeat that, like, with the exact inflection in your voice. I actually, uh, whenever you ask me to say my thing, I always, like, have, I'm tempted for a moment just to say one of you guys' things because I'm so used to it. So. We should do that. And really, now that we're not video anymore, we could really screw with people. But anyway, you can find my writing at Collider.com. My Twitter handle is at PNemroff. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next week. Guy leans on a guy, and suddenly the whole town just looks the other way. <laughs>